Today's speaker is Dr. Tripti Yaramili. Uh, we did not give her adequate time the last time because we had a second speaker. So I was speaking to her about coming back to talk to this group again because I realized that in spite of all of these meetings, there is still some lack of clarity in the community physicians about how to deliver oxygen. I'm not talking so much about delivering oxygen in a corporate hospital, private hospital, ICU, or even King George Hospital. In the community, before you get to a ventilator, a graded step-by-step -step escalation of oxygen delivery methods. That is my reason for asking her to come back and speak to us again. But today, Dr. Buddharazu will monitor the screen and will handle the Q&A, uh, assisted by Prem, of course, and also Buddharazu Garu will monitor the chat screen because it's, it appears that has been a domestic complaint from downstairs that I have spent far too much time on the screen. So today I must be excused because she complained I have not had dinner with her in almost one month. So I will be listening to her on the cell phone radio, but I would not be in front of the computer. So um, Dr. Budrazu is there. Uh, Tripti, you can begin, please. Good evening, Dr. Kairam. Good evening, Dr. Budrajam. Good evening to one and all, uh, to everyone in the U.S. and a very good morning to all here in India. So a couple of days ago, I had spoken about uh, the basics of oxygen delivery. Um, we had seen how... Triptigaru, uh, forgive me for a moment. Uh, today I reviewed all of these videos are on the YouTube channel. Surprisingly, they're pretty good quality except for the time people forget to mute their mic. When that sound comes, it's very disturbing. So I pray to all the people who are listening while she's speaking to mute your microphone and come back when she stops to ask questions, etc. Because it's a very good quality videos are there. Andhra Medical College, Kama, Vishakapatnam channel, the entire name, the Kama is important. Okay, sorry, sorry. Please proceed. Uh, I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Kairam, and I thank our principal, Dr. P. V. Sudhakar Garu, for giving me this opportunity today to speak. So, um, getting back to the topic, a um, couple of days ago, I had spoken about the basics of oxygen delivery, how each device is uh, basically different from the other right from the basal, basic nasal cannula to the face mask, to the NRBM, Venturi, HFNO. We had sp spoken about all these uh, um, devices and we saw how each device is different from the other and how each patient uh, is different. Each patient, uh, the oxygen requirements of each patient we had seen last time is tailor-made. So it's, it's different. So today we are basically going to see how we can start off with the, the basic common oxygen uh, uh, delivery devices all the way up to non-invasive ventilation. And also we will see when do we need to intubate the patient. So uh, uh, I would like to share my experience. Um, having managed a 10-bedded ICU at KGH, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, all of a sudden we were given a 100-bedded ICU. So uh, the, 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 um, the work had escalated. Our, um, uh, our demands uh, uh, from a 10-bedded ICU to a 100-bedded ICU had uh, uh, overwhelmed all of us in terms of manpower and also, you know, how to use uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, 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 lack of manpower. Drugs were not available when we were running the ICU to full capacity. And also the ventilatory strategies before the COVID and after the COVID also uh, had become, uh, we seen a huge shift in the very, before COVID, if there was a patient uh, who was desaturating, say if the patient was 88 or 90% saturation, the first thing we would do is 
intubate the patient. But with COVID, we realized that we can actually use non-invasive ventilation and also try many other modes because as you all know that uh, intubation per se has not brought good results. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we were skeptical about using uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation because of you know the aerosol dispersal. And before the COVID uh, pandemic, we would actually confine the NIV mask to people who had COPD, hyperinflation, these kind of patients. But, you know, it has been a shift from uh, during the COVID times where we basically, uh, the, the ventilatory strategy uh, for a patient who is not tolerating a normal oxygen, uh, common oxygen device is going right from HFNO to non-invasive and uh, to be very honest, we all know that non-invasive has given real good results uh, compared to the invasive modes of ventilation. So today I'm going to talk about how do we escalate the oxygen requirements in an ICU in a patient and how do we discalate? So if you see, um, first of all, we would be using the common oxygen uh, delivery device like uh, and also we have seen the therapeutic goal. The last lecture was all about the therapeutic goal in a COVID-19 patient. Our therapeutic goal is 92 to 95% in a COVID-19 patient. So that is the therapeutic goal. And uh, to achieve this therapeutic goal, depending upon the patient's inherent condition, uh, we start from the very basic. First, we go with the nasal cannula, nasal mask, and then you can see the escalation. Once these uh, low performance or medium performance devices don't work, that's when we make a shift to the HFNC, that is the high flow nasal oxygen. You put the patient on HFNO and you see how the patient is reacting. Is he improving or deteriorating? And then we make this crucial decision uh, based on certain parameters as to when to shift the patient to non-invasive ventilation. And, uh, um, and also, you know, if the NIV is failing, then we have to go for invasive ventilation. Likewise, today we are going to see how an intubated patient you know, once he is weaned off, he meets, he no longer meets the mechanical ventilation criteria. How do we discalate? We can actually, in an intubated patient, if he recovers well, we can directly go to NIV or we can even go to HFNC cannula. And a patient on NIV, you can discalate with the HFNC or HFNO. And uh, we can also bypass the HFNO, depending on the patient's uh, condition, to a uh, uh, you know, a uh, common oxygen device like a non-rebreather, Venturi, and then coming down to the face mask and nasal cannula leading to the discharge of the patient. So today we are going to see how do we escalate the support and how do we discalate the support in mechanical ventilation. Um, another thing, uh, today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the basics. There are so many students here, I feel it would be very useful for them to start from the very basics. With all due respect to all the veterans here, um, um, the lecture is going to be about uh, uh, from the basic level of how we start oxygen therapy in a patient. Like we all know, uh, I'm repeating again, the target is 92 to 95%. So uh, when do you use a nasal cannula or a face mask? It is important to understand that we use the nasal cannula or a face mask in a stable breathing pattern, a patient who is stably breathing. Like who, what, what, how can you say that the patient is stable? The patient is conscious. He has to be coherent and also cooperative. There's so many patients who don't tolerate. There are elderly patients sometimes who don't tolerate a nasal cannula also. So you have to have a conscious, coherent patient. And a stable breathing pattern does not have a huge um, uh, low SpO2 levels. So the SpO2 is generally in these patients about 90 to 95. Another important aspect is they should be hemodynamically stable. 
uh, for us to actually uh, put them on these uh, uh, nasal cannulas or face masks. An unstable patient wouldn't tolerate these devices and uh, the, the, you know, would have an increased work of breathing uh, or might uh, collapse on these devices. So um, these patients should also not have a very high or increased work of breathing. And most importantly, you will be using these low performance device when the airway reflexes are intact. That is the patient should be able to swallow his food. The patient uh, should be able to, you know, if there is a vomiting, the, he should not be drowsy. He should be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have those intact reflexes. There should be no upper GI bleeds. So these are the stable breathing patterns uh, where you use a nasal cannula and a face mask. Now coming to a patient who is having moderate hypoxemia. So moderate hypoxemia also, when you look at a, a, a non-rebreathing mask or a venturi mask, uh, you also need a conscious and coherent patient. And uh, this Again, uh, uh, patients have to be cooperative. And this is a moderate, the non-rebreathing mask or a venturi mask. Venturi mask is a fixed performance device and non-rebreathing mask is a medium performance device. So uh, uh, the next step of uh, uh, the, the uh, escalation is you have a conscious patient, coherent patient, but the SpO2 levels are 85 to 95. And the patient is having some amount of work of breathing. I'm, 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 um, uh, uh, I'm insisting uh, on the word work, increased work of breathing because we are going to talk about it shortly. And even these patients, we have, they have to be uh, hemodynamically stable, and also they should have intact upper airway reflexes for the same reasons which I just explained. So that is the second step of uh, uh, escalation of oxygen in the ICU. The third one is once from a moderate hypoxemia, the, the, the shift is to the unstable breathing pattern. Unstable breathing pattern also you have, a, you can have a conscious uh, patient. Uh, generally you have patients who are conscious, they're coherent. Uh, they are, their SpO2 levels are uh, definitely low, 70 to 90 maybe. They, they they are hemodynamically stable also, many of them. But in them, when you see an unstable breathing pattern, you can see an increased work of breathing in them. Increased work of breathing as in uh, the patient is not able to oxygenate. There is, the, there is deficiency in the oxygenation of the patient. Uh, the increased work of breathing is not helping the patient to open up the alveoli or recruit the collapsed alveoli. So in these patients correlating with the ABG, ABG is like have uh, for the post or the basic uh, students, it is the arterial blood gas analysis. So when do we go to the high flow nasal oxygen therapy? We go to the high flow nasal oxygen therapy uh, in a conscious patient, a patient who has a, a severe, a moderate to severe amount of hypoxemia, increased work of breathing, he should be hemodynamically somewhat stable, has intact airway reflexes. So the high flow nasal cannula I have explained is just like the nasal prongs. So you, the patient is comfortable, the mouth is open, like uh, there is no nothing covering over the mouth. So you can correlate with the ABG and uh, you go to the next uh, level, like the high flow nasal oxygen therapy when you are not able to maintain the patient on a saturation of uh, 90 to 95, when your target saturation is not maintaining and uh, the patient is deteriorating in spite of the non-rebreather or the venturi mask, that is when you make the shift to high flow nasal oxygen therapy. Uh, the previous uh, time I spoke, I did speak about the high flow nasal oxygen uh, the patient receives humidified oxygen, you know, up to, you can give up to 100% oxygen, generally in our ICU. Once a patient comes, he is unstable. When, once we receive the patient in the triage or in the ICU, and the patient we see is, has an unstable breathing pattern, we first try putting the patient on high flow nasal oxygen therapy. Uh, we start from maybe 40 liters with uh, uh, with 40 liters and an FiO2 of 100% and slowly depending upon the patients uh, 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 clinically assessing the patient and also with the ABGs, 
we decrease the uh, we decrease the flow and also the FiO2. So that is the decreasing uh, de-escalation of uh, high flow nasal uh, cannula. But if you see that the patient, in spite of high flow nasal therapy and his meeting increased demands of FiO2, that's the time when you understand that the patient might require more PEEP more PEEP like, uh, uh, than the HFNO can provide. The HFNO cannula for every uh, uh, 10 uh, liters of oxygen provides one centimeter of PEEP. So if the patient is not comfortable on an HFNO uh, cannula, that is when we again shift, uh, we take the decision of uh, now keeping the patient on inv non-invasive mode of uh, ventilation. So when do you start the patient on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? You start the patient on non-invasive when you again have an un unstable breathing pattern. You have to be, um, you have to remember that the patient has to be conscious. The patient has to be coherent here also and has to be extremely uh, cooperative. A non-invasive positive pressure ventilation can cause a lot of claustrophobia and uh, you know uh, uh, it, uh, the patient most of the times uh, has to be very cooperative because when you are applying the mask on the face it is going to give the patient a lot of pressure and this pressure not everybody can uh, get accustomed to it so uh, patient takes time and you have to uh, counsel the patient and only if the patient is cooperative you can go for a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation here also uh, generally we see these patients uh, you uh, whenever unstable breathing pattern they have come like i have told you you could have hfno but the patient is still having increased work of breathing that's when uh, we take this uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation into count. And here also, it is important to remember that the patient is hemodynamically stable, has uh, increased work of breathing despite the HFNO, and uh, intact airway reflexes are a must when you are putting a non-invasive ventilation because uh, the non-invasive itself says that your airway is not secure. So if your airway reflexes are intact, only then you go for a non-invasive ventilation. And again, uh, uh, like we have to correlate all of it with the arterial blood gas analysis. So like I've told you, I wanted to speak about the work of breathing. It is common practice uh, and uh, for people, uh, for doctors, many to just count the respiratory rate and take it into consideration. But please remember the tachypnea, the cause for tachypnea, the tachypnea is not equivalent to work of breathing. You know, when you have, when a patient is tachypneic, you have to rule out many other causes. Like maybe the patient is anxious. All of a sudden he is uh, told that he's COVID positive and he's isolated. He's brought to the hospital. He's not allowed to meet anybody. He doesn't know what his fate is. So the patient can, the patients who come to the ICU have a lot of uh, panic they're in panic they have anxiety so obviously there is in there can be tachypnea so identify why your respiratory rate is high is it because of anxiety does the patient have pain is there you know these are the various uh, uh, causes of increasing tachypnea but based on the respiratory rate we should not take the decision of uh, escalating the uh, uh, therapy, oxygen therapy. So what is important is we see the work of breathing. The best way to see or know that the patient is actually struggling for oxygen, struggling to get his needs met are when you see that the that the patient is having increased work of breathing. Uh, you can see there is a, a prominence of the sternocleidomastoid. That is one of the best signs to judge that this patient is not doing well on this device and he needs escalation. There is indrawing, um, uh, the, in, there is you know intercostal muscle re retraction, there's a tracheal tug and the nasal flare is there, you know, then you can safely say that this is the patient, clinically you can assess that this is the patient who is not doing well on this particular device and now I need to escalate it. It is not the respiratory rate and it is the work of breathing. Please remember that.
So that is how we judge uh, clinically a patient who is struggling to get air. Uh, the best way I told you, nasal flaring and sternocleidomaster, because most of the patients are covered up to the neck. So you can, uh, 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 so maybe intercostal muscle uh, retraction and all that you will not be able to see. But if you can see that there is flaring of the nostrils and the prominence of a sternocleidomastoid, then you can safely say that the patient has increased work of breathing and now you need to take an ABG and probably escalate your therapy. So um, the COVID, COVID ARDS or uh, CARDS, uh, we have all understood by now that it is a problem of it is not a problem of ventilation it's not that the patient has any kind of ventilation problem the problem is oxygenation the patient is not able to get oxygen so it is a problem of oxygenation and in covid we see a lot of increased work of breathing it's generally respiratory alkalosis and not hypercarbia and how do you improve this oxygenation in a covid 19 patient the first thing you do is you give FiO2. I, I have already discussed the various devices, escalation of the FiO2. FiO2 is not improving. You give PEEP to the patient. And the, the most important thing, like uh, which I would like to talk in detail, but I don't know if I'll have the time. But the thing is proning. Proning has been a game changer in in many scenarios, uh, in almost all scenarios of uh, COVID-19. So FiO2, PEEP and proning are the main determinants of uh, oxygen therapy. And uh, 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 coming to the evidence of saturation targets in ARDS, uh, innumerable studies have been done. And what do you think is the appropriate target for a COVID ARDS? Um, there have been studies where, uh, which has shown that any saturation, if you're trying to improve SpO2 levels more than 95%, it's not going to do any kind of good to the patient. Uh, there is, a, there is a, in fact, a, a study has shown that there is increased mortality in patients where you're trying to uh, maintain a saturation above 95. You do not have to maintain a saturation above 95. The second thing is the appropriate 92 to 95. Many other studies have, like I have repeated many times, that the target saturation in a COVID-19 patient is 92 to 95. And uh, there is another study which says that uh, what happens when your COVID-19 patient has a saturation of 88 to 92. Uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 studies have been done on this also and, and they have come to a conclusion that if you are maintaining a saturation of 88 to 92, leaving the COPD patients, okay, keep aside them. Uh, but if you're maintaining 82 to 92, that is also not good because once your saturation is only 88 or 90, it, there is a chance that these patients go bad because there is uh, mesenteric, they have noticed mesenteric ischemia and also there is ischemia to different organs in the body because your saturation is maintaining around 88 to 90. So it is very prudent, it is very advisable that we don't increase the saturation, we don't go to the lower level and we maintain these patients on 92 to 95 percent of uh, saturation. I would like to show the mortality and morbidity trial which uh, was done and it has uh, the summary is that supplemental oxygen uh, there is evidence that even if you give uh, oxygen you try to maintain oxygen about 95 percent it has caused morbidity and mortality in the patient and uh, uh, the new england journal of medicine there is an article where the liberal conservative oxygen therapy for ards it also says that it goes to the lower level of the oxygen therapy like uh, if your target is between 88 to 92 and if you're maintaining the patient on 88 or 90 there is every chance that you're causing mesenteric ischemia or you know causing ischemia to other organs in the body so that's about. So now we would like to see, uh, since we have seen what is the target oxygenation, uh, uh, let's recap. So the targets for oxygenation, if you have a pulse oxymeter and if you are seeing the SpO2 of the patient, the 
target SpO2 has to be 92 to 94, except in type 2 respiratory failure, like COPD, where the target is 88 to 92 percent. And if you're taking an ABG analysis, like arterial blood gas analysis, your target should be 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury. And in type 2 respiratory failure, the target is 55 to 70 millimeters of mercury. So those are the targets which we need to meet in every patient in the ICU for optimum oxygenation. So those uh, are the targets. Now, this slide is very interesting where it correlates, you are giving oxygen therapy to the patient, but not all patients utilize it in the same way. If you can see a patient here with respiratory distress, uh, the first patient is, so here we can see that the first patient uh, is having respiratory distress. So uh, how do you say here the min minute volume is really high and the respiratory rate is also high. You can see the patient having a respiratory rate of say maybe a 40 beats per minute and he's taking huge tidal volumes of about 750 ml. Uh, so there uh, the minute uh, volume when you calculate it will come around 30 liters per minute. And if you keep a nasal cannula to this patient and you're giving two liters of oxygen and this two liters of oxygen through via nasal mask is generally 100% oxygen. Okay, so 30 minus 2, the other 28 liters that the patient is drawing in is only 21% of oxygen which is present in the atmosphere. So here you can calculate 2 plus 28 is 30 liters, which is the minute volume. If you take into consideration the FiO2 of the patient, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, 100% oxygen uh, FiO2 with 2 liters plus the 21% of uh, um, uh, oxygen FiO2 into 28 liters by 30 will give you only 26% of uh, oxygen concentration. Whereas in a patient who is uh, not having this respiratory distress and this patient is uh, breathing 5 liters of oxygen, uh, is having a minute volume of say 5 liters and he has a stable breathing pattern. He is breathing around 10 beats per minute with the tidal volume of 500 and in this patient if you put the nasal cannula of about 2 liters, uh, you can safely say that the concentration of oxygen in him is almost double than that patient who is unstable. So this is how the oxygen flow rate and also concentration differs from patient to patient. Even if you're giving the same device to a patient, the oxygen flow rate and the concentration differs depending upon the minute ventilation of the patient. So that is what I wanted to uh, convey through this slide. The next thing is um, just a recap. This is just a recap. So this is a stepwise approach to a patient. You have a hypoxemic patient. You start the patient on oxygen device or a high flow. If that's not working and the patient is still hypoxic by, you know, by you can see clinically the work of breathing has increased. You put the patient on NIV. With the NIV, the patient is still not improving. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, then uh, there is another criteria for invasive ventilation. Then you will go to invasive ventilation. So intubation, when do you intubate the patient? Uh, many trials have said that uh, patients on NIV, if uh, after three days of NIV, they are not improving on NIV, then uh, you can actually intubate the patient. That is when you can intubate the patient uh, and don't wait till the patient is totally deteriorated. So they are suggesting that if the patient is on NIV and if the patient is not uh, uh, responding, then it is better to intubate before the lungs become really bad. And then you have, you can set your peak because that's the positive end expiratory pressure. It will keep the alveoli open. It will also recruit the dormant alveoli. So uh, uh, that is important. And uh, 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 then self-inflicting lung injury, that also has to be taken into account. And proning. Proning itself is another, uh, you know, um, one of the most important uh, factors we have seen that proning, how it is recruiting the dormant alveoli in the back. So this is just a stepwise approach, a recap of all that we have just spoken now. Uh, and uh, uh, coming to the um, PF ratio, in mild ARDS, you can see 200 to 300. And here, once your uh, P 
by F ratio, FiO2 ratio is 200 to 300, you can say that PaO2 uh, uh, in this patient, he is mild ARDS. You assess the work of breathing in this patient. Just assess the work of breathing. Is it high? Is, is it not high? If the work of breathing is not high, the patient is stable. It means that the patient is stable. Just give oxygen supplementation to this patient. And if the work of breathing is uh, high, then it means that the patient is unstable. You can directly go for intermittent NIV. Like you can try an NIV in between NIV. You can, if the patient is uh, uh, is is improving, then maybe you can discolate to again a delivery device, oxygen delivery device. Now, if there is, mind you, that is only intermittent NIV we can try in a mild ARDS or uh, coming to the moderate ARDS. You take a PaO2 by FiO2 ratio. Uh, with a moderate ARDS, it is important that we directly go and uh, start NIV because here the, definitely the work of breathing is more. Assess how the patient is. Is the patient doing well? So then you can discolate. Okay. And uh, if there is um, the work of breathing is still not, uh, 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 you know, rectifying or if there is your oxygen FiO2 is, uh, uh, the patient is demanding more of FiO2. That's the time, crucial time when you need to think of intubating the patient. And uh, uh, like I have said, if there is work of breathing is high, but uh, you know, there is a decrease in the FiO2, then you can still continue the uh, NIV. And in severe ARDS, uh, what we have seen is severe ARDS with scores less than 100. It is important that you continue NIV, but then always keep backup intubation ready. Uh, if, you know, your uh, FiO2 uh, is, demands are increasing by the patient or the work of breathing. And finally, when the patient is intubated, we can also think of other strategies like maybe ECMO. And uh, despite, you know, maximum ventilatory settings. So that is how we escalate in a COVID uh, patient with ARDS. Um, so we have good lungs. We have uh, this concept of good lung compliance and poor lung compliance, uh, which we have spoken. In both of them, uh, conventional ARDS strategies, like you can, you can, you should be able to using low tidal volumes and you need to have your plateau pressures below 30 centimeters. Those are the goals. And a good lung compliance, they, they work wonderfully when you give PEEP because they are compliant. Because PEEP, when you use, it will redistribute the perfusion, open up the alveoli. And uh, that is about the good and poor lung uh, compliance. For poor lung compliance, you have to give more of PEEP compared to the good lungs. So that is about the ventilatory strategies. We will see now one by one. So like I have, uh, this is just a pictorial diagram of escalation of oxygen therapy. You're using an nasal cannula, you're coming down to the venturi, NRBM, HFNC, and all these four not working. You take this decision of shifting the patient to NI non-invasive mask mask or a CPAP mask and then if still the work of breathing is more, the patient is uh, becoming drowsy, the patient is having hemodynamic instability, uh, that is the time when you and uh, uh, you shift to intubating the patient. So uh, coming to the non-invasive ventilation, the, the word itself says non-invasive means that you're not putting anything beyond the mouth of the patient. So it is non-invasive. It is the delivery of mechanical ventilation to a patient and they do not require an artificial airway. An artificial airway in the sense here, we all use an endotracheal tube. Endotracheal tube itself means that endotracheal, you're putting an invasive, you're putting a, a, a a tube inside the trachea and then you're trying connecting it to the ventilator and uh, ventilating the patient so non-invasive you just have a mask over the face and uh, uh, you give mechanical ventilation to the patient so let just let's see just uh, briefly i will go through non-invasive ventilation 
so uh, the very um, uh, important aspect of non invasive ventilation is it improves uh, the you know it avoids muscle fatigue you know because it's giving you peep it's giving you pressure support you know it's it's decreasing the work of breathing for the patient at the same time it it also improves the tidal volume because uh, it is recruiting the alveoli the dormant alveoli if you are giving peep you know positive end expiratory pressure where the alveoli are open the oxygenation is better when your oxygenation is better your work of breathing is coming down of course it is can be used for overcoming the peep and also it reduces the afterload uh, reducing the afterload and that is what makes the patient hemodynamically stable so this we have already gone through uh i would like to show you the various interfaces for a cpap or an niv so the first thing you can see is a nasal uh, uh interface this we don't generally use because there is a lot of leak in this uh, the, the the third one also you know uh, the, the third one the advantage is it has less aerosol dis, uh, uh, dispersion but the important thing is uh, to note that if you use a fully covered face mask it is going to be very claustrophobic for the patient and also the pressure will be hitting the eyes and the patient will be a lot more discomfortable uh, uh, using the full face mask so routinely in our setup what we use is we use a noro nasal mask okay let me show this so the oro nasal mask is a type of niv mask which covers the nose as well as the mouth and it this interface is connected to the circuit and a hf bacterial viral filter so you can see this Uh, the the body is made up of plastic and the base is made up of silicon because the base is made up of silicon when you're putting the patient uh, this mask it is it it reduces the occurrence of uh, you know pressure source so this is the basic niv mask and uh, it has a harness and uh, this harness you're supposed to put very tightly on the patient so initially it can cause a lot of discomfort the patient has to be really cooperative to undergo this uh, niv mode of ventilation and the third and the latest one is the helmet uh, we haven't started using helmet yet here at kgh but helmet is supposed to be uh, the most comfortable kind of uh, uh, interface for niv uh, purely because uh, the patient is not having anything tightly fitted to the face and it is completely closed it is also uh, that's why it is in, it is very good for patient comfort at the same time it will decrease the aerosol dispersal and uh, probably it will also reduce because the patient is comfortable uh, uh, there will not be opening and closing of the mask causing self inflicting lung injury so the helmet is the the one of the best devices or interfaces for an niv um so let us see what are the different types of niv modes uh, we all know it is the cpap bipap and niv i'll go through quickly and cpap is when your ipap is equivalent to e uh, epap uh, uh, is when you have the cpap and in cpap you can almost give up to 50 to 100% of uh, uh, fio2 with 15 liters in a bipap it is bi level ventilation uh, where you have an ipap and you have an epap and the negative pressure will is what the will help the gas to flow inside the lungs uh, please remember with the bipap you cannot achieve a concentration of about 100% fio2 because you have the atmospheric air which is diluting and that is not the case with an niv mode of ventilation here it gives both peep and pressure support pressure support is nothing but but ipap minus the epap so not all ventilators have cpap mode but with niv mode of ventilation you can go to an fio2 about 100% so this is just a graphic uh, pictorial uh, representation in a normal breathing it uh, the pressure touches uh, the base zero and in a in a cpap it never touches the base but ipap is equivalent to epap whereas in the bi level you can see you have different pressure gradients by which you can actually give peep to the patient so so few tips for connecting the niv always remember that when you are connecting the niv to the patient you have to have the ventilator settings ready before the patient comes to comes to you you have to attach the niv to the circuit and apply and immediately start so it should be done only after 
you have applied the interface to the patient. And always remember, you have to use a bacterial viral filter between the interface and the exhalation port. That's very important because we have this problem of aerosol generation. And this aerosol generation is minimized when you have the bacterial viral fil filter intact. So these are the few tips for NIV connection. Now, let's see, uh, I have talked spoken about the escalation up to HFNO. Now I'm going to talk about how do we initiate NIV? Within NIV, you start in HFNO, we used to go from 40 liters or 60 liters, we descalate. But with HFNO, you start with the bare minimum. You start with a PEEP of six, say give 15 liters of oxygen per minute, see how the work of breathing is. If the work of breathing is okay, continue. But if the work of breathing is has increased and your F, S, SpO2 value is below 92, say, then you have to incrementally increase the PEEP, you know, up to 10 centimeters of water. And all of this has to be done after taking an ABG. Take an ABG half an hour after you have incre increased the PEEP and see how the PAO2 value is. Is it improving? Is it not improving? How the work of breathing is? Do you have to escalate more? So that is how you go about with an NIV. So uh, if there is no work of uh, increased work of breathing, keep the same PEEP, titrate the FiO2, uh, FiO2, and after four hours, just repeat the ABG. It is all clinical assessment and you have correlation with the patient's arterial blood gas analysis until and unless you achieve your target of 92 to 95%. So you choose your ventilator, uh, where you need to put an NIV mask, you have to make the uh, ventilator ready before the patient comes. You choose your interface. We commonly use the oronasal interface here at KGH. We still don't have helmets here. Choose your settings. When the patient comes, assess the patient. Is the patient conscious, coherent? Is he, is he the candidate for NIV? Or you can't put NIV in this patient. Is he hemodynamically stable? Is he having intact reflexes? So reassess, reassess the patient. And according to that, that will help you with uh, a periodic evaluation of the patient will help you uh, give an insight as to whether it is successful or a failure. So the, in, the advantages are uh, with non-invasive ventilation, you're doing away with everything that is there with invasive ventilation. You are not you don't have to sedate the patient. You don't have to paralyze the patient. And there's so many other problems which are uh, seen with an invasive mode of ventilation. So it is flexible. Even application is simple. You can ask your technician or anybody can apply the mask. It is easy to apply. Whereas intubation requires uh, expertise uh, only uh, People trained in intubation can intubate. Not everybody can do it. And then um, the patient can preserve the speech, the uh, everything else. And like I've already mentioned, the complications of invasive uh, ventilation are uh, done away with. Uh, the thing with the um, NIV is, uh, if, whenever you're giving air with pressure, it can actually cause, because your uh, esophagus is also there, it can cause gastric distension and discomfort to the patient. Uh, it can cause aerosol. A lot of leak happens with the NIV mask and uh, it can cause aerosol dispersion. Uh, like I've said, it, anything which covers the mouth and the face is very claustrophobic for the patient, very discomfort. So uh, the patient is having uh, uh, a lot of discomfort. And the most important thing is because of this discomfort, the patient keeps on removing the mask. And that that's a very dangerous situation to see because that's when you keep on removing the mask and then putting it inside, it can cause self-inflicting silly, self-inflicting uh, lung disease. And then always I have told you, the patient needs to have uh, intact reflexes. You have to clinically keep on uh, judging the patient, that this patient is not becoming drowsy, has intact reflexes, is not vomiting, is not uh, aspiring. So those are all the dis disadvantages you have with an NIV. And the contraindications I've already uh, uh, discussed earlier, poor hemodynamics, uncooperative patient, inability to protect the airway. If there are some kind of, some kind of trauma or burns on the face, then obviously you will not be able to uh, put an NIV and directly maybe you'll have to go from HFNO to intubation. Those are the special considerations. <clears throat> now, your COVID-19 patient is 
totally uh, ha- is is doing good on niv what do you do how do you wean the patient you will just see the patient for about a day and then what you will do is you will uh, try to remove the patient from niv for an hour and put the patient on another oxygen device a lower device say uh, a venturi mask or an nrbm and uh, see how the patient is doing and this should be uh, done in the ratio of 3 hours of niv to 1 hour of venturi or nrbm followed by 2 is to 2 and then you can slowly escalate you can keep 1 hour of niv then followed by 3 hours of venturi and assess the patient clinically assess the patient take the abg and then plan for the step down step down should always happen 24 hours and once the patient is stable on uh, 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 oxygen delivery device uh, below the niv only then can you uh, discharge the patient from the icu and uh, also never wean the patient until the abg is done and your abg should be always your weaning should always be based on the pao2 value which you get so uh, you your covid-19 patient is having increased work of breathing in spite of an niv uh, the fio2 values are constantly uh, uh, incremental you have to keep on increasing your fio2 values you see the you see, you take an abg and your abg is still not corrected and your pao2 by fio2 value is also low that is the time or your patient is becoming drowsy because uh, on niv uh, that is the time you should consider uh, invasive mode of mechanical ventilation so when do you intubate so uh, whenever the respiratory rate is really high or you have high work of breathing this patient is gasping for air unable to breathe your spo2 levels at the same time are not uh, are always below 90% your pao2 by fio2 is less than 150 your gcs is low the patient is hemodynamically unstable that is the time when you have to go to intubation intubating the patient so um, i still recall my first intubation with a covid-19 patient um, trust me uh, it is it is very uh, uh, challenging first thing is um, it is traumatic for the doctor also because you have this moral versus ethical dilemma when you are trying to intubate a covid-19 patient uh, ethically you are a doctor you are supposed to intubate the patient but morally you uh, you you are also having a family so the doctor is uh, uh, and your response something happens to you what will happen to your family so this kind of intense uh, moral versus ethical dilemma is always there for a doctor going in for intubation so uh, intubation is the highest aerosol generating procedure that's the reason why uh, you should always have someone who is expert the best in your team the person who is the best should only go for intubation because with a single attempt if they can pass the endotracheal tube and not do repeated attempts then the aerosol generation will be low and preparation is also important no a single person cannot do intubation you should always have a team like say two others should also be there beside the uh, doctor who is intubating to hand to give drugs to the patient because you should paralyze the patient and give multiple drugs to intubate the patient so uh, the one who is intubating will, will be at the head end of the patient trying to oxygenate the patient and the other doctor uh, would be giving the drugs assessing the vitals of the patient and uh, uh, helping the uh, the personnel who is intubating or the senior most anesthesiologist with the equipment for intubation uh, we need to pre oxygenate the patient Uh, like you can see here we have uh, we are using a cpap mask uh, with a bacterial viral filter and with an ambu or with a circuit uh, we are uh, we pre oxygenate for about 3 minutes pre medication it is the usual uh, we try to avoid propofol but uh, it's like uh, same glyco giving glyco midazolam fentanyl and uh, ketamine or etomidate and always paralyze the patient we use rapid sequence intubation we use succinylcholine to intubate uh, the patient and once uh, um, you have given your muscle relaxant important thing is since i have told you that uh, 
in way, uh, putting an endotracheal tube or intubation is the highest aerosol generating procedure. It is important that you clamp the tube. Okay, you do a direct laryngoscopy. Here you can also use advanced uh, video laryngoscopy if available. And in many places, we also have boxes, you know, box put over the patient with two holes where you don't have, you are somewhat protected from the aerosols. Once you intubate the patient, put the endotracheal tube inside the trachea, you connect it to the uh, circuit, you can release the clamp and put a viral filter in between. So post-intubation management is again a challenge. Um, in KGH, we have done a couple of intubations, but um, post-intubation uh, management is really important. You need to sedate the patient. You have to assess the patient every, every minute, like throughout uh, the stay. So um, we haven't had any much, um, I can say, we have lost most of the patients we have intubated here. Um, it is sad to say that uh, we have done intubations, but we couldn't see the results. And we lost many of them about, on an average, three to four days past uh, uh, intubation so results with intubation have not been very encouraging for us here so this is the procedure of intubation you are uh, pre-oxygenating the patient before intubating um, so um, this is how uh, the intubation uh, intubated patient is you have an artificial airway that is the endotracheal tube c2 and uh, 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 that's about it. But uh, let us see what are the various lung protective strategies. Uh, it's important that uh, you have used low tidal volumes. Always have your plateau pressures below 30. You can use a high peep depending upon the patient's clinical condition. Uh, because in ARDS, you have to uh, 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 use low tidal volumes. There is There can be permissive hypercapnia, but then you have to... Uh, uh, oxygenation is more important. That's the reason why you will permit permissive hypercapnia in these patients. And proning. Proning has been a game changer in COVID-19 patients. Proning with HFNO is far easier because you just have a nasal cannula compared to the NIV. And proning in uh, an invasive mechanical uh, patient is even more difficult because the patient has all kinds of tubings, a tube in the mouth, a tube, maybe a central venous uh, catheter. So proning in an invasive patient is far more challenging than proning in, say, a HFNO or a, a non-invasive patient. And definitely, you don't want your patient to have any kind of dyssynchrony with the ventilator. So um, these patients, it is prudent that you sedate them or, you know, you give them a neuromuscular blockade so as to give rest to the patient when you are doing uh, invasive ventilation. So this is a self-inflicting lung injury. It can happen when there is a lot of dyssynchrony with the ventilator. So uh, that is uh, about it. But uh, let's see. Your COVID-19 patient just got intubated. Generally, the mode which we use here is a volume-controlled ventilation. We set the respiratory rate of about 20 beats per minute. In volume control, you have to put different settings. You can start with a low tidal volume of, say, 6. And uh, first, the FiO2 should always be 100%. Later on, you will decrease it depending upon the patient's clinical condition. Uh, you can set the PEEP high to 15 and check the plateau pressure. Is the plateau pressure increasing? It should always be below 30. So reduce your tidal volume accordingly. Okay. So if your plateau pressure is still high, then you can call for help. But just see what you can. Is there anything wrong with the settings or uh, tubings or whatever? Uh, ensure that the patient is not struggling on the ventilator because anything you put it in the any any artificial device you have in the mouth it will cause a lot of gagging pain. Uh, for this very reason, the patient will be struggling. So. It is important that the patient is well sedated. The sedation which we use here in, at KGH is regular fentanyl we use here. 
sometimes dexmedetomidin but fentanyl is the uh, is the uh, sedation we use here and then keep on checking your abgs keep on checking if your pao2 values are uh, in, uh, increasing or not so that is how we go about with intubation so your covid-19 patient is improving then slowly you will decrease your fio2 levels or your peep levels and you will only set the lowest fio2 and the lowest peep which is maintaining your patient at around 92 to 95% saturation so that is how you deescalate from uh, in an intubated patient so what are the what is the readiness to wean criteria so here you can see a pao2 of an fio2 ratio uh, it's more than 200 and your peep levels have come down it's come down to almost 6 or 5 there is hemodynamically the patient is stable you don't need to use vasopressors uh, for this patient so uh, uh, there is no need of hemodynamically stable patient the patient is conscious awake you know you he's responding to what you're saying um uh, the patient is able to have intact airway reflexes and your rapid shallow breathing index is less than 100 after 2 minutes of spontaneous breathing trial so that's how you try to wean off the patient i've told you when you wean off the patient from invasive you can directly come to the niv or the hfno depending upon the patient's comfort so uh, that is how you wean the patient so this is an algorithm which i have already discussed um i'll skip this so uh this is again uh, why we intubate uh, severe respiratory distress poor sensorium um pf uh, less than 150 or you know hemodynamic instability these are the reasons for intubation of the patient and uh, once the patient is intubated what next um in kgh we don't know we don't have an ecmo machine but many of the private hospitals here in vizag they have been uh, using the ecmo machine after intubating the patient after 2 3 days they're planning an ecmo for the patient but uh, with covid 19 patients from what i have heard the ecmo uh, there is a lot of mortality once the patient goes on ecmo what next what next after invasive ventilation ecmo or probably a lung transplant so uh, this is a lung transplant which uh, i am not aware of any lung transplant which has taken place for a covid-19 patient here in vizag but uh, that is uh, how uh, we go about it this is how we escalate or deescalate the use of oxygen therapy in a patient in um, our icu thank you thank you dr trippi that was pretty elaborate and informative um so since we're running out of time i want to run through some questions quickly the first question was from mark uh, about how do you decide the therapeutic goal of 94% uh, saturation why not 92% or above 94% i think you answered that through those trials um, uh, the new england journal publication i think the who criteria right now is uh, to maintain equal to or at least 94% during initial resuscitation followed by maintenance target of 90% there are exceptions to this uh, like people with chronic airway disease and uh, uh, people who have copd uh, the target can be somewhat lower and uh, pregnancy is another special situation where you're targeting higher o2 saturations i think uh, the who guidelines there are 96% um so do you have a comment on that doctor uh yes dr budraju so uh, the thing is uh, according to various studies we we here have uh, seen the target of 92 to 95 based on these studies only so uh, according to the studies if you are improving trying to improve the oxygenation beyond 95 also it's not helpful because it's causing oxygen toxicity and you're making the patient more dependent on oxygen the patient once he is dependent on oxygen very difficult to wean him off so it is important that you immediately try to wean the patient as soon as the patient becoming becomes stable so that's the reason why we don't want to uh, increase the oxygen saturation it will cause wastage of oxygen at the same time difficult to wean cause oxygen toxicity and also we have we have seen another the trial where uh, 
where if you're trying to maintain a saturation of less than 90 percent then also the patient is deteriorating because uh, then you're not giving adequate uh, oxygen or you're, you're causing ischemia to the various other organs in the body like they have seen uh, mesenteric ischemia uh, decreased urine output so that's the reason it is important that you maintain your saturation between 92 to 95 uh, in your patient the next question is from Dr. Sanjeeva. I think he's talking about uh, the patient on mechanical ventilation, ideal PEEP for poor compliance in ARDS patients with COVID. Uh, and also, can the patient be proned uh, while on mechanical ventilator and on high PEEP? Um. Uh, definitely proning, like I have said, is very important uh, to recruit the dormant alveoli. It increases uh, the alveolar uh, uh, oxygenation. Uh, but in uh, they are, uh, there is a lot of challenges faced when the patient is intubated. Like I've already said, there are a lot of tubings in the patient, a tube in the endotrachea, the uh, trachea, you know, a central venous line, lots of uh, uh, cannulas uh, in the body. So it is difficult, but still, it is still advised that you prone your patient on uh, on non-invasive ventilation also. And uh, Dr. Budras, can I comment on this? Sure. The PAPE? Sure, Prem. Okay, right. Well, he has asked about PEEP, and in uh, COVID, gatinonis types. One is an L type, and another is an H type. L type means low. Elastance, that means high compliance. Whereas that H type means high elastance. Elastance is inverse of compliance, so that is low compliance. So what happens is from a high compliance lung, as the disease progresses, it will reach a low compliance. That means lung is becoming stiff. These are gatinonis L type and H type. So when there is a good compliance, you can use a peep of around 10, 12. I mean, uh, but very low compliance, stiff lung, more PEEP is required to open up the collapsed alveoli, so may go up as 15. But any ARDS, actually the ARDS network trial said you can go up to 24 if it is a PEEP of one, but it is, I never feel that what is given in Western figures is not true for India, because our chests are small when compared to the American or European chests. So our pulmonary functions are 80 to 85 percent of the European Caucasian people and you know Western people. So those peeps which are designed, the trials are designed, trials were done there. They say 24 is okay, no ARDS, but for us, I always feel a little less. So 80 percent of what they have recommended. So 10 to 12. And if there's a good, compl low compliance, poor compliance, maybe 10 to 15, not more than that. And any PEEP beyond 15 offsets the benefit. And uh, for critical care people and anesthesiologists, a uh, recent concept of the PEEP, optimal PEEP so far has not been decided, but the lowest PEEP which can give a good oxygenation of at, our, at least 90 to 92% is good. And the uh, concept is the PEEP which gives the lowest driving pressure. Driving pressure is plateau minus PEEP. So whichever is lowest, that causes less damage to the lung. So the PEEP, which causes lowest driving pressure and usually try to keep the driving pressure between 12 to 14 or even less. So these are the modern concepts of uh, choosing a PEEP. So uh, okay. Prem, uh, that's an interesting concept. So the, the whole purpose of using higher PEEPs or escalating on the PEEP, I thought was to recruit more alveoli, right? Um, so, uh, so what do you do when the plateau pressures are rising rapidly and the machine is alarming? You're already on a PEEP of 12 or 13 or 14. Uh, what are the maneuvers would you use at that Time. I would come back to Dr. Tripti's comment on ventilator mortality. I think that needs to be addressed. But uh, the common uh, dilemma in people, at least that I'm seeing in the private sector, is they're not, they're kind of lost when the when they're already at 14, 15 peep and the plateau pressures are rising. Well, uh, is it me to answer? Yes, Prem. Raju, you're. Okay, right. Yeah. So first of all, what 
a plateau pressure means it's an inspiratory hold pressure if you apply a 0.5 second pause during inspiration it's an inspiratory hold pressure that means how much the alveoli are distended and they have the pressure is hold right so if the plateau pressure is increasing what does it mean so first you think you look at the peak pressure even if the peak is also increasing along with the plateau that means it's most probably an airway cause not normally the peak is increased and along with that the plateau is also increased and the air peak and plateau difference we call it as a trans airway pressure usually around 5 cm if that is stable it is only a lung or a clt so lung or pleural cause but if the peak and plateau difference is increasing beyond 5 that means trans airway pressure is increasing there must be a problem in the airway like i know um endotracheal tube block or a bronchospasm like that. and only if the plateau is increasing as i said there may be a sudden onset of pulmonary edema new onset pulmonary edema or a new pneumonia or a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion or the uh, endotracheal tube has migrated down into the right side that is the right main stem intubation so that the left lung is cut off and it is collapsed so all these reasons why the plateau increases so these are all causes of increase in plateau pressure in general for a mechanical ventilation but i understood your point that if the compliance of the lung all these things are ruled out so if the compliance of lung is poor in a you know uh, ards case what do you do as we discussed earlier we used low tidal volumes of 6 ml per kg even then the plateau is high probably you can decrease to 4 ml for compensating for it is increasing the you know respiratory rate and then if the plateau is still high probably if all the causes are ruled out we may sedate or paralyze for you know 24 to 48 hours not beyond and then even then the plateau is high still more low tidal volumes and i will accept permissive hypercapnia that means as i am decreasing the tidal volumes from 6 to 4 and all the co2 removal will be less because of low minute volume but still i would like to accept the co2 as a barter to the barotrauma so how much co2 i'll accept i'll accept up to 90 cm of h2o but it should be a gradual build up that means for every hour not more than 10 cm of H- co2 build up how do you do that so not all of a sudden from 500 ml of tidal volume you have to re- you will reduce the it to 200 1 ml per kg that means a 50 kg individual initially 500 to 450 450 400 400 like that if you are gradually decreasing by 50 ml the co2 gradually builds up slowly rather than a sudden build up that's how the strategy of permissive hypercapnia is to be done thank you Uh, thank you, Prem. Uh, <clears throat> another question from Dr. Manoj Patruni. Uh, let's say that a patient is shifted from HFNC to NIV, and on NIV the patient is not doing good clinically, develop acidosis. How frequently should they be checking blood gases? Dr. Tripti, you could answer that. Uh, so, a patient on NIV, and you have set a particular amount of PEEP or FiO two. after setting your peep after half an hour you can check your abg and if the patient is stable uh, the pao2 is okay every fourth hourly in our icu we generally check fourth hourly abgs or uh, if the patient is stable uh, or uh, sixth hourly also we do the abgs to see how the patient is improving or deteriorating at the uh, same time so we also dr manas yeah okay. go ahead dr sudhakar dr. has raised his hand Yeah, uh, you asked a good and valid question, and the availability of ABG in our ICUs is uh, really difficult. Doing very frequently. That's why initially I thought several levels of doctors working at various levels, like PHCs, community hospitals, and the district hospitals are also attending here. So the ABG availability is really difficult for them. So what are the clinical signs of hypercapnia? So you said patients' work of breathing is increasing. is getting tired accessory muscles are contracting sweating beads of sweat over the forehead is anxious so that's the look 
and you want to look for the CO2 because anyway pulse oximetry will tell you about the oxygenation. But for us, how do you know about the CO2 other than ABG? So you know you need to know the clinical signs. So if patient is having headache or patient is slowly going drowsy because of CO2 narcosis. Or if you shake hand or if you hold his hand, the hand will be warm and sweating. So carbon dioxide will cause peripheral dilatation, vasodilatation. So the hand will be warm and sweating. So a warm, sweating hand, drowsy patient, acts, uh, work of breathing is more. That means he is retaining his CO2. And at that moment, probably you can do a ABG to C if CO2 is rising. It's not the CO2. Always, suppose a COPD patient, his baseline CO2 is high, more than 40. How do you decide? If it is 58, it's not bad for him. So it is, my statement is, treat the pH, not the gases. So always treat the pH, not the gases. If the pH is less than 7.30, that's worrisome. And definitely if it is less than 7.25, I would act. So always you should have clinical science of hypoxia in, uh, uh, in the mind in our you know, primitive setup. Hypoxia, patient will be restless, agitated, and whatever oxygen you are giving, he will be removing his nasal cannula, he will be removing his you know, mask. You think that he is uncooperative, but it's because of his hypoxia induced cerebral irritation he is doing like that. You have to identify that point. Okay. So hypoxic patient will be irritable, restless, removing. CO2 narcosis patient, he will be drowsy, sleeping. That's why in a COPD patient, if you administer oxygen and if he is comfortably sleeping, I am very much worried that he is retaining his CO2. That's why he is becoming drowsy and comfortably sleeping. You are thinking that he is comfortably sleeping, but he is becoming drowsy and drowsy. Okay. So shaking hands, I would like that. Hypoxia, cold, very cold hand because of hypoxia. And uh, CO2 narcosis or CO2 retention, very warm hand because of the peripheral vasodilation. So clinical signs are important in our primitive setups. Of course, um, Sparsely, we can do an ABG right there. Oh, thanks, Prem. Uh, Dr. Sudhakar. Uh, I have one uh, question, yeah. Dr. Uh, Prem Garo. Uh, Dr. Sudhakar, uh, as just, you mentioned, just a uh, 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 Dr. Patrunik, uh, if you can just wait. Um, uh, let's see what uh, Dr. Dr. Sudhakar yeah, has. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Vudraj, you can, uh, you can just continue because. Uh, uh, it's a continuous question. Right? It is a supplementary question. I can sure. come back and uh, ask. Sure. Uh, Dr. Patroni. Yeah, Dr. Prem, as you, uh, you mentioned right now, in hypoxia, the patient is uh, non-irritable and he is uh, happily sleeping. And uh, in clinical therapy... Is... No, no, you got it wrong. Hypoxia patient will be irritable, restless because yeah, of the yeah, cerebral yeah, hypoxia. Yes, yes, yes. You exactly, got it wrong. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not in case of hypoxia, in case of uh, raised uh, pH, if the patient is like uh, non irritable and then he is uh, 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 drowsy, what is this uh, next alternative if we do not have the ABGs to check upon the patient and come to a diagnosis? It is not the raised pH. Raised pH means it is alkalosis. The pH will be low. It is acidosis. Yeah, no, anyway, yeah, we, no, we are not doing that. I could, uh, I, I understood your point. So yeah. if you are administering oxygen through a nasal cannula or a mask at 6 liters or 8 liters or 10 liters, patient is becoming drowsier and drowsier. So if the ABG is not available, what is it? You know, you can reduce the oxygen. Okay? You can reduce the oxygen and see if his consciousness level is improving or not. Or you can take it for granted that he is becoming drowsier and drowsier and difficult to wake him up. You have to change the device. Go to NIV to remove the CO2. Or if he is too bad and unarousable or unconscious, you have to intubate. So then on NIV and the patient is not stable and then in acidosis and then IBG <clears throat> is not available. Uh, what is the other alternative uh, method for this? How to go Intubation. on with, uh, Internet. Obviously, okay. on, on an IV, if the patient is still drowsy, and if the patient, you know, um, drowsy or anaerobic, so that means NIV is not sufficient to remove his CO2. What is the next step? Intubate and a closed circuit so that 
you can take his breathing into your control you can adjust the respiratory rate you can adjust the tidal volume so you can control his minute volume and co2 is inversely proportional to the minute volume you increase the minute volume you can reduce the co2 right okay, okay. and on niv then if the patient and the abg is available so the patient is acidosis and he is not doing good how frequently we need to check up on the abg see that's what i said you you have to go by clinical if the patient is becoming drowsy you have to otherwise you know if your abg if you are having an abg you can repeat it every second hourly but okay, is it possible how many times you how many times you prick a radial artery yeah that is that too it's a pandemic situation see if you have a five or six patients in an icu that's okay in a pandemic situation doing abg see realistically if tripti agrees with me huh? we are not doing abgs frequently we are going only by pulse oximetry and co2 status just by looking at the patient if his work of breathing is increasing or till now increased work of breathing is now gradually slowing down and the patient is becoming drowsy and unarousable it is co2 that's it okay okay, okay. and uh, actually in csr work we are having the portable abgs and we are doing but uh, even though uh in maximum many setups as you were uh, telling this is not happening and that is the only doubt uh, which has uh, got into my mind because no doctor patruni yeah. hundreds of cases in a pandemic and how many abgs how fast how soon you can repeat them it's really questionable yeah, in a pandemic yeah, yeah. doing repeated abgs you know hmm, definitely it's yeah, not possible it so not you should go by clinical criteria but if you have, you have the luxury of doing it every hour you do it okay okay thank you yeah uh, tripti i have two questions for you uh, tripti are you there yes sir i'm here yeah uh, there are two questions one is frequently we say that the patient's cooperation is necessary for the proning and so on uh, would the non cooperation of the patient is because of um, is psychological imbalance in the form of you know claustrophobia and other uh, panic situation or can it be attributed to the hypoxia through which the patient is going how do i to, how to identify whether it is because of the hypoxemia the patient is not able to cooperate or is it because of the psychological uh, burden that the patient uh, has that is number 1 the second question is about uh, the invasive ventilation you said that the invasive ventilation the outcome of the invasive ventilation is far inferior and do you have any statistics on that as to how many have you intubated and how many succumbed out of the intubated patients how many were came out of the niv number 2 do you have any statistics comparable to your center compared to the other centers when the how many have come out of the intubate intubation how many patients came out after intubating and is there any substantial difference if so what's the reason for people not coming out of the invasive ventilation okay sir so the answer for your first question is uh, proning in an niv patient so an niv we keep to the patient only when he is having unstable breathing pattern but at the same time the most important thing for putting an niv mask is the patient has to be conscious coherent and also should be able to understand whatever we are saying so before keeping the niv mask we try to counsel the patient see you have to sleep on your tummy you have to prone and uh, that will be really useful for you it is for your sake that we are telling you this so we try to counsel each and every patient uh, on niv uh, to prone Uh, sometimes what happens is like in the escalation phase of niv we generally start with a uh, peep uh, high peep and uh, uh, lower peeps and fio2 of 100% uh, but uh, uh, if the patient is not improving in spite of high peeps and uh, uh, increased pressure supports and also with the uh, maximum fio2 
then what happens is when you see an abg you will definitely know if the patient is having hypoxemia so if your pa2 value is less than uh, 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 70 or 65 at the same time clinically you can see that there is indrawing of uh, the sternocleidomastoid you can palpate the the work of breathing is more uh, the patient is hemodynamically not stable or becoming drowsy as in carbon dioxide narcosis so in all these scenarios was the patient it does not uh, become the level of consciousness is not as good as a patient who is stable on niv so for every patient we try counseling them to sleep on prone position time and again as long as they are coherent and they are stable on niv but once they become unstable uh, uh, like hemodynamically or uh, clinically the work of breathing is increasing despite maximum pressure support or peep uh, that is when they become irritable and they don't try, tend to listen to you so that is about a uh, proning we generally try advising people to sleep at least 15 hours a day in our icu but that has not been happening we try to counsel most of the patients we tell one patient they see the next the, the patient on the other bed Uh, because we have this dormitory kind of uh, setup if if all the patients are sleeping prone if a con- coherent patient would definitely do it they also look at the people what they are doing in on the other beds so uh, a, a lot of uh, counseling goes but then like uh, uh, i've mentioned whenever the work of breathing is more of, or the patient is not tolerating niv properly clinically or abg wise then they become irritable and they don't tend to listen to us so that is uh, about proning second question sir uh, i have not done any studies depending uh, upon how many patients have come out of niv or intubation i have intubated a uh, few people but um, i'm sorry to say that we couldn't uh, revive any any patient on uh, invasive uh, ventilation the max i can say is 3 to 4 days uh, the patient had survived beyond that uh, we don't have positive results so uh, when i compare our setup with the private hospitals in uh, and around vizag i do have uh, uh, my colleagues uh, saying that uh, they they have also had very little success with intubation and invasive ventilation but they have managed to pull out people uh, two or three maybe not not tens or hundreds very few people uh once they have intubated the patient so once you are intubating the patient you have to make sure that you are giving a lot many more drugs uh, a lot more uh, drugs and many other uh, 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 you know you are uh, making the patient dependent maybe on uh, your uh, respiratory um, uh, uh, para- non um, uh, paralytic agents or you know sedation and as such in ARDS uh, it's the end stage so very little uh, very little volume is there it, uh, it there are many problems because of intubation itself you know the technique of intubation even maintaining the intact tube without uh, it getting blocked these are all the various challenges that we are facing while uh, the patient is on invasive mode of ventilation so here and also the lack of manpower sir what i feel is uh, we used to run a 10 bedded we have a regular icu here at kgh it's 10 bedded we have seen very good results we have most of the times we have tried to pull out the patient uh, wean the patient off invasive ventilation we are not able to do it in in the csr block maybe because we don't we it's 10 bedded here and it is 100 bedded uh, at the csr block and only one of us uh, as assistant or we ha- we need m- more um if we are intubating the patient the patient has to be con- uh, continuously watched upon and uh, you have to administer uh, n number of drugs that is not the only case but i feel uh, intubation itself uh, brings along with it multiple problems and uh, as such the patient's lung has deteriorated to such an extent that the patient can no longer uh, uh, no longer uh, uh, breathe by himself that's when your intubation is coming into picture so even if we take into account different uh, private hospitals in and around vizag they have intubated the patient very early on in the disease maybe like i have said 
after three days of invasive ventilation, they have intubated and maybe they have brought out. Those are the patients they have uh, brought out only to again go back to the same cascade cycle. So the results with intubation have not been very fruitful here. I am uh, I I've heard Dr. Budaraju speaking about intubation uh, having uh, somewhat success rate of around uh, 30 to 40 percent in the states. But uh, unfortunately, here the um, the scenario is quite different. The story is different here, sir. Thanks, Dr. Tripti. Before uh, I uh, give the mic to Dr. Sudhakar, uh, I think he might be able to answer this question as well. Yes, there was a significant improvement in mortality numbers between March of 2020 and now in U.S. and most Western countries in ventilated patients. Um, but the resources we have in the West are, are totally different from what you have there as resources. So one suggestion is there has always been this issue with critical care training in India. You know, I don't think it has changed a whole lot since I left uh, in the early 90s is most of the medical critical care is done by cardiac anesthetist, if I um, uh, am saying right. Um, very few chest physicians are actually trained in ventilator management, even in their post-graduation. So uh, one thing to improve outcomes, if not now, to be useful down the road, once one idea to think about is, is to make it mandatory for our chest uh, disease PGs and um, uh, general medicine PGs and anesthesia PGs to actually be trained in medical mechanical ventilation in the setting of either medical critical care or surgical critical care and make like a two month or three month rotation mandatory so they're actually trained um, um, uh, at multiple levels, so not just the anesthesia. I think it would be important to, on the medicine side for people to be trained in critical care and management of uh, mechanical ventilation, I would think that it would be very useful for our chest physician postgraduates, especially to be trained in uh, uh, management of medical mechanical ventilation. Um, maybe Dr. Sudhakar can comment on it. And also, if we are losing so many patients, we should probably have morbidity and mortality meetings and to actually in detail go into these charts what is it, why is it that we are losing these patients on day three, day four? What has changed? What can be done differently? Are they having hemodynamic collapses? Are they having barotrauma? Are there issues with endotracheal tubes? Uh, can we uh, do tracheostomies early and avoid uh, you know, endotracheal tubes uh, for prolonged periods? I think we should probably look at that. And I, I, I bet you we could improve the outcomes if we approached it in a methodical way. I would take this as a challenge rather than, um, I know the resources are poor, but I would like Dr. Sudhaka to comment on it. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Bujaraju, for all those comments. And uh, from uh, the response I got from Tripti, uh, what I understand is for my first question, uh, I mean, this is to put everything in a nutshell. Uh, like she said that uh, it is the psych psychological aspects as well as the hypoxemia both contribute to the patient cooperating with the prone ventilation. That's what I understand. In certain circumstances, when uh, the hypoxemia is the reason for patients not being cooperated to, in others, when people psychologically, they are not good enough uh, to cooperate. These are the, they both go hand in hand. That's what I understand from what she said. This for the second um, question the, regarding the outcomes after intubation. Um, I understand that uh, the outcomes are different in different settings uh, in Vishakhapatnam itself. And compared to the Western world, it is much lower than what we are seeing here. And uh, she has pointed it out to the system failure in the sense that uh, people, not a, enough number of people being there to monitor the patients. Uh, is the one that she said. And uh, early intubation is another one that she said that uh, a decision to intubate them early is another reason. Uh, not uh, taking a decision, thereby causing uh, delayed, delayed decision leading to death. So these are the two reasons that she has, um, uh, uh, that's what I understand from her answer. Uh, with regards to what Dr. Budraj said is, I think the curriculum is well designed and each one of them are supposed to 
uh, have a, uh, they should have a reasonable understanding of the mechanical ventilation even for the pulmonary medicine specialists and uh, the anesthesiologists most of the anesthesiologists they go through all these icus what is required is uh, the individual attention and um, uh, the drive to learn i think that's more important so most of the requests i get from the chest medicine are they are not um, they'll not be able to intubate as effectively as the anesthesiologists they would often tell me that to send an anesthesiologist to intubate the patient and keep to keep him on the mechanical ventilator so that they will follow that patient through so uh, this is what uh, the request that i get i usually get and um, i we tell the anesthesiology department to go and help them in intubation because they are asking for a help uh, here there are two aspects one is the anesthesiologist should come forward to go and help them so that they'll maintain the they are willing to maintain the uh, the ventilatory part of it the second one is um, the uh, pulmonary medicine post graduates and uh, the trainees they should learn to intubate very effectively it's not difficult because now that we have the mannequins and all uh, it's not that they practice on the patients uh, themselves right from the beginning the repeated um, uh, the, you know repeated practice uh, the practicing on a mannequin repeatedly would always give them a better chance to intubate more effectively i think shying away from intubation is something uh, that has to be avoided by the pulmonary medicine specialists as well so the curriculum in curriculum all this has been written but only problem comes in the execution <clears throat> and our uh, uh, the heads of the departments and the concerned professors they should insist on the students uh, to go through through this cycle very effectively and that's from my side dr budraj if you have anything to add and uh, if i can be permitted yeah. to add dr raj can i go ahead yes <clears throat> Dr. Trupti, you nailed it. The mortality, as you said, is high. Various reasons. One is, you know, we are performing intubation and putting the patient on a mechanical ventilator just as a ritual, just before death. That is not correct. Okay. Um, if you do intubations a bit early, I think we can pull through some other cases. Second thing. uh maintaining a patient on intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation is real real labor intensive a lot of personnel are required to keep the patient prone supine and always checking the endotracheal tube whether it is you know intact or not is blocked or not and uh, monitoring the co2 we are we will monitor the po2 pspo2 on a pulse oximeter but here i think i should i we would we should encourage buying etco2 probes and if the etco2 probe is you know uh, connected to the endotracheal tube that will obviate the need for repeated uh, arterial punctures so i request the administrators to procure etco2 probes earlier we had them and uh, <clears throat> um trouble shooting so after teaching the mechanical ventilation how to intubate what are the various settings tidal volume low tidal volume optimal peep and all those things there is a routine teaching but trouble shooting is one chapter which is required okay if something happens if peak pressure alarm is giving what to do if plateau is high what to do if low minute volume alarm what to do hmm? if you are doing an esophageal intubation what will happen hmm? you intubate and the patient speaks when if the patient is talking when you have intubated means that they are not in between the vocal cords that, that is in the is of fact and the saturation will be dropping all these little nuances you should teach to the learners and uh, most important is trouble shooting in a mechanical ventilation that is a great chapter and if uh, we train our pgs in trouble shooting of mechanical ventilation that would be great the outcomes will be great and as well as i said maintaining five or six ards cases in a uh, icu is so difficult and in a pandemic situation maintaining you know tens and uh, hundreds of patients on mechanical ventilation that to in invasive is real labor intensive okay and um, that's it and uh, finally um, teaching about intubation see as a post graduate i attended the anesthesia department for 15 days so anesthesia people will teach us how to intubate 
patient is in a theater setup everything is optimal and you know associate assistant everyone will be there they try you just will open up show the vocal cords you just put it the tube and we used to put the rush tubes that red, red rubber catheter tubes so if we are unable to do that they will do it immediately so that is an ideal condition and ideal scenario but intubation in a critical care setting is totally different there the patient was paralyzed in the theater you do everything sedation paralysis kept ready for the surgery and putting it so intubation in a critical care situation emergency patient is crashing patient is crashing eh? even sometimes you have to do an awake intubation eh? how to set up your propofol midazolam fentanyl all these things cause hypotension sometimes when the patient is hypoxic and you know struggling for breath there will be a lot of sympathetic drive and once you sedate him and paralyze that sympathetic drive is lost totally at that moment abruptly so his bp will fall eh? and at that moment it is really difficult so what i suggest is present curriculum is okay but what i suggest is critical care training is a must critical care training in a real critical care scenario so outside there are a lot of courses md emergency medicine md critical care if we really uh, you know if uh, those two courses are introduced anyway md uh, emergency medicine it's on md critical care would be very good and the training must be the pgs should be trained in a critical situation to intubate rather than an ideal situation where all are present and patient is fully prepared for a surgery paralyzed calm and after paralysis if you open the you know if you introduce the laryngoscope it will open like a you know python's mouth and you can do that so i feel intubation in a critical care scenario in a crashing patient that training is required thank you so prem i think uh, you know one answer to that question is very simple if we mandate all our post graduates to uh, renew their advanced cardiac life support acls designated who or whatever designated acls courses for all post graduates every year as a refresher course number one number two is is um, you know if uh, we have a uh, dedicated rotations in medical icus and surgical icus for all post graduates especially uh, chest general medicine anesthesia have them actually do one month or two month or three month rotations so in our medical schools here what we do is say we have a 50 bed icu it will typically be manned 24 hours by at least one Uh, at the level of assistant professor another at the level of associate professor usually manned by about two post graduates or fellows in our case um, both day and night along with three or four internal medicine residents and uh, and so by the end of that rotation the internal medicine residents are well aware of how to manage a critical care patients most of them will actually learn a little bit of mechanical ventilation too they learn central lines they learn management of uh, interpre- interpretation of arterial blood gases and uh, um, you know they come out well trained at the end of that two or three month rotation maybe we have to look at something like that and also if there's difficulty for chest physicians for intubation in a in a critical situation like that i would think that at least the senior pgs would be trained in bronchoscopy right if they needed to um uh, if they're having difficulty intubation they should be able to do it with um, some assistance from either laryngoscopy or uh, bronchoscopy frame what yeah yeah i fully agree with you i echo what you say but that is the need of the hour actually we have a a is american heart associations acl as training uh, for house surgeons but uh, for some reasons now in in stuff at the beginning of the house surgeons they are completing it uh, the acl as is uh, the, i mean bls at the end of the house surgeons so i think if the bls the beginning of the house surgeons and as you said acl as advanced cardiac life support and all these things for every pg you know the certification duration is also it lasts for one or two years after that is, as you said is, we have re- yeah so it is two years but it's so cheap yeah, and probably we, we have, free of, uh, free uh, of no, cost we have, uh, we have to you know train them and retrain them everyone should renew their skills that's important 
and i i agree with you fully that the acls course for every post graduate is important and after that nursing care is also important so our nurses should also be trained at least critical care nursing should be a specialty and because you know bringing out a patient on a mechanical ventilation it depends on a lot of factors not only the doctor in the nursing staff so uh, critical care nursing that should be a specialty should we should develop so whatever instructions we give the nurse should be able to follow or at least she should identify some problem an alarm here what happens if the alarm rings on a ventilator just silence the alarm that's all but why it is alarming uh, that nobody looks into is it a high pressure alarm low pressure alarm high volume alarm low volume alarm what is happening the fio2 you know is it the sensor that is at fault or the uh, inlet gas fio2 is low so many things it will give an alarms but you know it is simply it, people i think uh, the you know, routine work they just uh, prime i think you know, uh, uh, silence the alarm we're, we're running out of time it's 9 uh, 8 uh, 940 here so i think uh, kairam yeah. is back i is probably going to yell at me for <laughs> extending past uh, the time uh, thanks again dr tripti garu prem thank thank you and uh, uh, for for everybody uh, kairam do you want to take over sir you are muted sir unmute unmute kairam no i shall never yell at you you have become my newest friend and texas is not a very friendly state so i look forward to friends from nebraska no 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 i i want to tell you uh, all of you it's almost 25 days now we have run this continuously every night it's not that easy to find additional speakers and if it's the same speaker all the time it's also not easy to maintain the attention of the audience i do want to tell you Prem, it has been very important to have so, you there. Whatever I speak, they will hear. Thank right? you. Uh huh. Sudha Bade Garu. Ah, uh, sorry, sir. Okay, Prem Garu. It was very important sir. the last one month to have you there all the time, to be listening all the time, not like me, and to give valuable suggestions like you do. So stay on the screen until Sudha Kar gets tired. Dr. Budraj Garu, thank you, thank you so much. Very, I've been very happy that you've been around, that you are available, that you are current on a lot of these topics. I thank you uh, for handling tonight, Tripti. I thank you for coming back a second time. Thank you. And sir. even though sometimes it looks, it might sound a little tedious to go through all of those methods, and I think back about everything that has happened in the past few months. That is key. the rest of it is not a big deal it's like a 14 item prescription that's very popular in andhra pradesh but what you teach is very important for people to understand memorize remember ask questions about the various methods of delivering oxygen is key because this disease is predominantly an oxygen disease everything else about it is not that difficult to comprehend why does this cytokine storm occur when it hap happens when the bottom falls out how we get multi organ damage and how to maintain oxygen delivery is the key element in this disease for that reason it was good to have a knowledgeable articulate anesthesiologist such as yourself so Thank stay you. around please even it becomes less common not as frequent as every night uh, after tuesday we might return to every sunday uh but siva has done a good job of as of today 14 of these lectures are on the youtube channel i hope he puts the other ones there for but please advertise to the other people if they show any interest but are un- unable to log in at 6 am all you have to do is to go to entire long line andhra medical college kama visakhapatnam channel but there are so many amc channels but this one is Andhra Medical College, continuous, comma, Vishakhapatnam channel. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Sudhakar. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Ramohan, for uh, 
those excellent words and the advocacy with regards to the uh, the YouTube channel that we have now. And uh, I thank Dr. Budraju, Tripti, and uh, Prem Kumar uh, uh, for doing a wonderful job today. And uh, for the next couple of days, uh, three days, we'll be continuing uh, the same uh, morning sessions here and evening sessions over there. After that, we will probably go back to our original schedule of uh, weekly meetings. Uh, thank you all again, and um, uh, we'll leave the meeting at this point. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night.